Hey guys, before we get started with the intro, I just want to point out that the seven-part mini-series on the Nutritional Pyramid of Importance were actually the first seven episodes that I'd recorded for the podcast, so please bear that in mind when leaving a rating and review. Uh, my microphone technique was probably not quite up to scratch and I was still figuring out the process, so please bear that in mind. Cheers, guys. Yo, what is up, guys? Welcome to the Live, Train, Perform podcast. I'm your host, Sean Kober of Performance Functional Training. I'm currently the head strength and conditioning coach at the world-renowned Tiger Muay Thai and MMA training camp based in Phuket, Thailand. I'm a strength and conditioning coach, nutritional therapist, NLP master practitioner, a former Australian Army soldier and combat veteran. This podcast is dedicated to bringing you the tools, knowledge, experience and expertise to allow you to live your life to your fullest, train to your potential and perform at your best. I'm going to do that by providing three different styles of podcasts. Style one is going to be three to five part mini series, 15 to 25 minute episodes each covering numerous topics including nutrition, lifestyle, sleep, stress management and training philosophies. Style two is going to be me interviewing people at the top of their game, who they are, how they started out, where they got to where they're at and what makes them tick. Style three is all about you guys. I'm going to be answering your questions. You can find that on my Q&A memes, which I'll be posting on my social media platforms. My social media platforms are at Instagram at K-O-B-E-S underscore P-F-T at Kobes underscore P-F-T. Facebook is Performance Functional Training and YouTube is at Performance Functional Training. Make sure you like, subscribe and follow those platforms. Uh, I will be referencing my YouTube channel throughout the episodes. So if you want your questions answered, go on to the memes, the Q&A memes that I'll be posting on my social media platforms. Pop in your questions and I will answer them for you on the podcast. Let's get it. Yo, what's up guys? In the last episode, we went through the nutritional pyramid of importance. So to recap, we had energy balance at the bottom, followed by macronutrients and fiber, then micronutrients and water. Following that was uh, different diets, intermittent fasting, uh, calorie cycling, carb cycling, etc. And rounding it off is supplements. In today's episode, we're going to be covering the base of that pyramid, which is energy balance. Now, what is energy balance? Well, first of all, we need to talk about what energy is and how we measure that. So we typically use calories or kilojoules. I'm going to use calories for uh, these podcast episodes because it's a more universally uh, known measurement. Uh, But essentially, we have energy in, which is through our food and drink and consumption. We have energy out, which is through our body's metabolic processes, uh, our daily movement, exercise, Uh, and things like that. So this is the law of thermodynamics. The law of thermodynamics states that to lose weight, we must be in a calorie deficit. To gain weight, we must be in a calorie surplus. And to maintain weight, we must be at calorie maintenance or energy in equals energy out. There are caveats to this, however. As I stated in the previous episode, a healthy organism is an adaptable organism. So if you're putting your body under so much stress that it's literally in survival mode. Even if you're in, uh, manipulating your calories in and calories out, your body may not uh, may not adjust and adapt in the way that you want it to because it's literally fighting for survival. To prove the law of thermodynamics, in 2010, a professor Mark Horb of the Kansas State University conducted an experiment. He was a professor of human nutrition from the Kansas State University. He lost 12 kilos in 10 weeks eating a diet consisting of junk food. This is now known as the Twinkie diet. So you can go online, you can search for this. What actually happened was he improved his health markers over those over those 12 weeks. Not simply because he uh, was eating shit, but basically because he actually reduced his body fat levels quite significantly. So uh, he reduced his calories from 2,400 calories per day to down between 16 to 1,800 calories per day and didn't change his exercise habits. So this proved the law of thermodynamics. So when it comes to manipulating your weight, we're looking at energy balance, energy in, energy out. It's not everything, but it is a massive portion of manipulating your weight. In the first episode, I recommended that people track their food. That's going to give us an indication of your energy in, but that's only one part of the equation. For the next few minutes, we're going to figure out your energy out. 
So this is, uh, there's a number of factors that contribute to this. So the first one being basal metabolic rate. A basal metabolic rate or BMR is how much energy our body requires just to live and survive. All right, so if we're in a coma for 24 hours, we're asleep for 24 hours, your body's still going to require X amount of energy to sustain itself. These numbers are going to be different uh, for the sexes, different people, uh, different lifestyle factors, etc. Uh, males, we're typically looking at 1,800 to 2,400 calories just to live and survive. Females, we're typically looking at 1,400 to 1,800 calories. Again, there's going to be some differences. There's going to be some outliers here, but that's a general base. So our BMR is what our body requires to keep our heart beating, keep our lungs breathing, keep our digestive system working, our brain ticking over, our uh, hormone function and regulation doing its thing, etc., etc. This is all the shit that you don't even have to think about. The body just keeps ticking over. So that's your basal metabolic rate. We'll dive into uh, the components that contribute to that in a moment. Following that, we're going into our physical activity level. Okay, so this is what you do for work. This is what you do uh, for exercise, what type of training you do, how long you train for, um, what you're typically doing on a day-to-day -day basis, basically. And the final component is our NEAT, non-exercise activity thermogenesis. So this is a number of factors like fidgeting, uh, things that you don't consider exercise, maybe if you talk with your hands or whatever. Uh, and also the thermic effect of food. So it's a little bit of an all-encompassing thing uh, that, that basically covers everything else that uh, basal metabolic rate and physical activity level don't cover. All of these numbers contribute to your total daily energy expenditure, or TDEE. Now, it's important to know what these numbers are because then you can, uh, you can put them up against your energy in and see exactly what's going on. If there's a massive imbalance there where your total daily energy expenditure should be, say, 3,000 calories and you're only eating 1,800 calories, then there's a sure sign of some metabolic slowdown. Your body's going to adapt to whatever energy you're putting in. It's going to start slowing down other processes to prioritize survival. All right, basal metabolic rate. Now... Uh, there's a number of factors that contribute to this, but I'm going to keep it really simple and talk about three. We have age. Uh, let's take a 14-year-old boy, a 44-year-old man, and an 84-year-old man. Which one of those is going to need the most energy? Now, in my opinion, we're either living, or sorry, we're either growing or we're dying. So the 14-year-old boy, he's growing. His testosterone's all over the place. Hormones are doing their thing. They're all whack. Uh, he's developing, his bones are growing, becoming denser, his muscles are growing, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So he's going to require a lot more energy, probably going to be moving a lot more throughout the day as well. Now, the 84-year-old man, he's dying, unfortunately. You know, he's going downhill, he's going the other way, things are starting to atrophy. So he's typically not going to be moving as much and he's going to, uh, metabolism is going to be slowing down, testosterone production is decreasing, uh, bones are becoming less dense, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So he's going to require less energy. Now, here's the tricky part. The 44-year-old man, is he, live, is he growing or dying? Well, that depends, completely depends on his lifestyle. You might have a 44-year-old that looks after themselves, goes to the gym, works an active job, um, and eats good food. His metabolism might be firing. He might still be growing. On the flip side, we probably all know people that are the same age that don't take care of themselves, that uh, sit on the couch and play PlayStation, smoke bongs all day and do fuck all. So that person is probably going to be dying. Their body's not going to need as much energy. One of the next contributing factors is sex. Males obviously have a high propensity to produce testosterone, which is going to impact muscle mass. Uh, so they're going to typically require a little bit more energy than females. Now, that's not to say that uh, a jacked female has a lower basal metabolic rate than a skinny dude. If you have a lot more muscle mass, then you're probably going to your, your engine is going to be bigger. You're going to need a lot more fuel. Uh, we'll talk about that in the lean body mass component, which is next. But something else to consider for females as well is that time of the month. When they're going through their menstrual cycle, they're going to be bleeding. They're going to be losing some energy. It might actually be worth bumping up the calories around uh, that time. Uh, you know, think about some of the signals that females get when they, when it is that time of the month, they're going to be craving foods. Their body is like literally churning through all of their glucose, uh, blood sugar levels crash, and they're just fucking craving sweets. We all know what that's like. So, 
um, it's worth looking at bumping up the calories a little bit more around that time and maybe adding some fats and proteins in, a little bit more fats and proteins along with the carbohydrates so that we can balance out those um, those blood sugar level rises and crashes. We want to keep those blood sugar levels as stable as possible throughout the day. Uh, I'll talk about this more in the micronutrient, uh, sorry, the macronutrient portion in the next episode, but essentially uh, we want to balance those blood sugar levels out because if they're not balanced out, then that causes havoc with the hormones. The next contributor to our basal metabolic rate is our lean body mass. So consider this, I've got two cars, one's an eight cylinder car and one's a four cylinder car. They're sitting right next to each other, both empty. I pour five liters of fuel in both of them, turn them on to start. At the same time, leave them to sit there and idle. Which one's going to run out of fuel first? That is going to be the eight-cylinder car because it's got a bigger engine. It's going to require a lot more fuel just idling. Now, that's just idling. That's just sitting there. Think about what happens when we then go and put the foot on the accelerator. It's going to be churning through a lot more fuel there. So let's relate this to people. If I've got a 100-kilo man at 10% body fat, meaning 90 kilos lean body mass, and I've got another 100-kilo man who's 30% body fat or 70 kilos lean body mass, they will need different amounts of energy to get through the day. Depending on you know how they've gone into this study or this research, uh, obviously, but let's say everything else is equal, uh, the guy with 90% lean body mass is going to burn a fuckload more fuel just at rest. Now, once they start going and training, then they're putting the foot on the accelerator. The dude that's got 90 kilos lean body mass is going to start churning through that. He's got a V8. He's got a big engine, requires more fuel. The dude with less uh, muscle mass, higher body fat percentage, is not going to be burning through as much. It's important to note that muscle is metabolically active. So even if you want to lose weight, it's super important to put some muscle mass onto your body so that your body can actually start burning through those calories and be really efficient with energy even at rest. And again, you start training, you're putting the foot on the accelerator. All right, so that rounds out our basal metabolic rate. Important thing to note here is that everyone's basal basal metabolic rate or BMR is different. Uh, BMR could contribute to up to 85 to 90% of your daily energy requirements. Think about the dude that sits at home, plays PlayStation, smokes bongs, does fuck all all day. His BMR is probably burning through 90% of his daily energy needs. Someone who's super active though might only be, or their BMR might only be taking up to, you know, roughly 60% of their daily energy needs. So 60% of their daily energy needs keep everything firing, working as normal. Uh, Then the other 40% is going towards movement, uh, what they do for work, uh, you know, hobbies and things like that, training, uh, etc. We'll talk about that in a little bit more detail in the NEAT component, which is coming up soon. The next component is our physical activity level. This is what we do for work and what type of exercise we do, how long we exercise for, etc. Now, important to note, basal metabolic rate is at the top using 60 to 85% of your daily energy requirements, followed by what you do for work. What you do for work could contribute to anywhere from 10 to 30% of your daily energy requirements. Then exercise comes into play. So exercise is way down the list. A lot of people think that just because I've exercised, I can now go and eat whatever the fuck I want. Well, you're doing it wrong and you're not going to get any results that way. You're literally just going to be chasing your tail. So let's talk about how we can manipulate our energy uh, dependent on what we do for work and also what type of training we do. Let's take two people. Person A is an accountant. Person B is a stonemason. I'm going to look at a 12-hour day from 7 o'clock in the morning until 7 o'clock at night. Uh, Let's say they both work a 10-hour day, 7 to 5, and then uh, the accountant sits behind a desk all day, and then from uh, 5 p.m. until 7 p.m., goes to the gym, hammers himself, lifts weights, gets after it, finishes with high-intensity interval training session, all right, then goes home, has a feed. Now, the stonemason, on the other, on the other hand, uh, works at 10 hours, an active job, outdoors. Then in the final two hours, five to seven, goes and picks up the kids, uh, takes the dog for a walk down the park, throws the frisbee, throws the ball. All right, now over that time, which one of those people is going to burn the most energy? It's the stonemason. He's going to be active throughout the day, and that's what matters most, is what you're doing fairly consistently on a day-to-day basis. Uh, don't quote me on these numbers, but let me give you an example of how this might work. The accountant sitting at the, sitting at a desk from 7 to 5 might only be burning 100 calories per hour in that time. So at the end of a 10-hour day, 
there's a thousand calories. Even if they go to the gym and absolutely hammer themselves, they burn through a thousand calories in an hour and a half. There's only 2000 calories in that 12 hour period. The stonemason, on the other hand, works a 10 hour day outdoors, might be burning 200 calories per hour. At the end of a 10 hour day, there's 2000 calories already. Even if they do nothing um, and go down to the park, play around with their kids, you know, no extra movement or anything like that. At the end of that 12 hour day, now they're burning 12, 200 calories in those last two hours uh, per hour, sorry. Uh, at the end of the day, there's 2,400 calories total that the stonemasons burn. So even though the accountant is training and hammering himself, it doesn't undo the fact that they've been sitting and sedentary all day. Very important distinction, very important to note here. Now to round up, uh, we're looking at our NEAT, non-exercise activity thermogenesis. This is essentially anything that we do uh, outside of burning energy through BMR and our work and our training. So Think about any hobbies you have. You might go surfing a couple times a week. Uh, you might uh, walk the dogs couple every day. You might, you know, go grocery shopping. You might go hiking, scuba diving, whatever. Any of your hobbies. All right. So, obviously, anytime you move, you're going to be burning energy. So, if your uh, hobbies are quite active, then you might look at bumping up your numbers a little bit, uh, depending on what your goals are. Now, consider this: basal metabolic rate is not going to change from day to day week to week your body's going to require that energy on a daily basis to keep everything churning over then we have our physical activity level this is going to change from weekday to weekend you think about what most people do monday to friday they're at work then they go to the gym on on the weekend they might sit around and do fuck all or they might be super active so it makes sense to manipulate their uh, energy balance on those days uh, and the last one is NEAT. This is going to change day to day depending on what you're doing. Now, let me give you an example of why it's important to understand this energy balance in differences on a day to day basis. When I was at home in Australia, I, I thought that my uh, daily energy requirements were pretty much the same on a day to day basis during, during the week. Now, this was not the case, and I didn't find this out until my mum actually bought me a Fitbit. Now, I was like, oh, why the fuck do I need a Fitbit? That's just for people to get a little bit of a notification, give them a kick up the ass to get up and start moving. Once I actually started using that, using it, I saw a fuckload of benefit in it, though. Uh, it gave me some data, which I could then uh, take some information from and then apply some knowledge. So, an example of this is my uh, Monday, Tuesdays were fairly busy or very busy, uh, Wednesday was a little bit quieter, uh, Thursday, Friday was busier. So my uh, Tuesday, for example, I'd go in, I'd, I'd drive to uh, the outskirts of the city, I'd walk into work, I'd train a couple of clients, then I'd train myself, then I'd go and have some brunch, then I'd head back into the gym, train some more clients, etc., etc. In the afternoon, I'd go to rugby training. Those days, I'd check my Fitbit and I was taking like 24 to 26,000 steps. So somewhere between 14 to 18 kilometers per day. It was a fuckload of movement. All right. Then my Wednesday was a little bit quieter. So Wednesday, I'd go into the gym. I'd train my, uh, my clients. I'd train myself. I'd, ha I'd have some brunch. Uh, and then I'd pretty much work my laptop all day. I'd put together training programs. Um, I'd send off invoices and things like that. At the end of those days, I might have only been taking six to 8,000 steps. So I'm looking at four kilometers so of walking. Now, for me to eat the same on those two days was completely ridiculous. In my mind, I thought I was, you know, they were pretty, pretty, pretty similar days in terms of movement. But once I looked at the numbers, they were actually way, way, way different. All right, so let's figure out total daily energy expenditure. I'm going to give you a very simple way to figure this out, how I use this as a rough guide. Now, let's talk about basal metabolic rate first. Again, guys, we're looking at 1,800 to 2,400 calories. If you have more muscle, push towards the higher end of that number. So if you're super muscled uh, and you're only at 10% body fat, you might hit 24. All right, if you're at 15% body fat, you might drop down to 2,100 calories, for example. If you're at 20 to 30% body fat, then you might be looking at 1,800 calories as a baseline. What I'm going to do now is then add my physical activity level on top of that. I'll use an example, let's say uh, 2,100 calories. So I'm roughly 15, 20% body fat. I'm at 2,100 calories for my basal metabolic rate. Now, when it comes to physical activity level, we're looking at roughly 500 calories per uh, 10,000 steps. So 
Uh, if I'm only taking 5,000 steps, I might only add 250 calories. If I'm taking 10,000 steps, I add 500, 15,000 steps. Uh, 750, if I'm taking uh, 20,000 steps, I might add 1,000 calories. So let's say I'm, eating, I'm hitting 10,000 steps. I take my 2,100 calories, basal metabolic rate. I add my physical activity level. I'm going to be looking at 2,600 calories. All right, so there is my basal metabolic rate and my physical activity level. I'm now at 2,600 calories. What I need to do now is add my NEAT, my non-exercise activity thermogenesis. So what I typically do here is I'll give a range of a couple of hundred calories. So my baseline total daily energy expenditure is now at 2,600 calories. Uh, then I'm going to add roughly 150 calories either way. Uh, so this is going to be completely dependent on how active you are. If you're super active, you might add 300 calories either way. So now I might go 2,300 calories up to 2,900 calories. Now, why do I do that? This is a very simple way of just going, all right, well, I didn't move anywhere near as much today. I'm going to hit the lower end of that spectrum. Or I moved a fuckload today. I'm going to hit the higher end of that spectrum. Now that we've figured out our total daily energy expenditure, we need to go back and have a look at our energy intake. So if there's a massive imbalance here, then we might have caused some metabolic damage and we may need to go through a reverse diet. I'm not going to go into that too much here uh, because this episode is already quite dense. I'm going to split this up into two episodes. But essentially, let's say we're hitting, we've worked out our numbers, we're hitting, or we should be having 2,600 calories for our body to thrive. Then if I'm looking at my energy intake and I'm only eating 1,500 calories, there's a massive difference there, okay? My body's already been in a deficit for a long period of time. This is what you'll typically see when people have been in a diet phase for a long period of time. They're not really tracking their food or they are tracking their food and they've literally just been eating low calories for a long period of time. Your body is going to adapt to that. It's going to slow down its metabolic processes to uh, adapt to whatever uh, amount of energy you're putting in your body evolved to survive. So it doesn't give a fuck that you want to look good on the beach or for your wedding or whatever. It is literally literally focused on surviving. And if you're eating low calories for long periods of time, then it's going to slow down its metabolic processes. This is called metabolic adaptation, completely normal process that your body goes through. This is literally the business model of so many health and fitness retreats. You'll see people that go to these health and fitness retreats for say three weeks, uh, they get put on a 1500 calorie diet and told to exercise three times a day. Now, no shit, you're going to lose weight. Your body's literally gone into shock. You're not getting much energy in to even fuel your basal metabolic rate, but also uh, you're burning a fuckload of energy. So uh, what happens here is people get really good results over these three weeks, but of course they're going to. They've, they've created a huge calorie deficit. Now, over a short period of time, yeah, you're going to lose a lot of weight. Your body's going to be like, holy shit, there's not much energy coming in. Let's tap into our own stores. You lose a fuckload of weight. Plus, what typically happens is you're not eating uh, many carbohydrates, which then your body's not holding uh, glycogen, which water binds to. So you're going to lose a whole heap of water weight as well. You're not actually use losing fat. But what people actually do is they get really good results over these three weeks. They go home. They've gone from eating 1,500 calories, training three times a day where they might be burning 1,500 calories to eating normal, they might bump back up to 2,000 calories and now they're only training once a day, burning 500 calories. So now they've actually put their, their body into a massive 1,500 calorie surplus. After that, uh, that signal that your body's literally fucking starving, once food starts coming in again, your body goes, oh shit, man, we didn't deal with that very well last time. I need to survive. Next time food comes in, let's start storing that shit. Let's start putting that away. Let's put that in a safe space for next time our body's under massive amounts of threat. So then what happens is weight sl starts slowly coming back on, you know, over the next couple of months. All of a sudden, six months later, you're right back to where you started before you went to the health and fitness retreat and you go, fuck. What happened? How did this happen? Uh, and then you go, right, I know what got me in shape last time. I'm going to go back to that health and fitness retreat. Excellent business model. Boom, repeat customers. In the last episode, I recommended that people track. This is where those numbers start coming into play. We look at those numbers against each other. Let's say we've got 2,600 calories, our total daily energy expenditure, how much we're burning. If we're only taking in 1,500 calories, there's a massive, diff massive imbalance there. We need to start balancing that out. 
Okay, if you're not even getting enough energy in to support basal metabolic rate, your body's literally in survival mode and it's not going to adapt the way that you want it to or it will for a little bit and then it's going to hit a plateau and you're not going to go anywhere. Then you're going to need to do a lot more work and you're going to eat, need to eat less, which actually pushes you deeper and deeper and deeper into that hole, which makes it fucking harder and harder and harder to get out. The longer you stay there, the harder it is to get out. So uh, this is where a reverse diet comes into play. I won't go into this in too much detail, but this is essentially where we start uh, building our energy in uh, up and up and up and up gradually over time so that we can uh, push our uh, energy in back up towards our energy out. So now we're hitting equilibrium. Now our body is in a safe space uh, and it becomes healthy. A healthy organism is an adaptable organism. There's going to be some fairly significant uh, signals to read that's going to tell you whether or not you'll, you need to go through a reverse diet. It's likely going to have low libido, low sex drive. Maybe you have some trouble regulating uh, core temperature, etc. So uh, these are all signs that maybe your body's not getting enough energy and it's literally having to run on fumes. This is where it's very important to consider how you're feeling, pay attention to how you're feeling. Your body's constantly giving you signs and signals. And if you're a little bit fatigued, you're under the weather, you can't, you know, your sex drive is has crashed, it's in the tank, uh, you're not sleeping very well, you're never very well rested, and you're always fatigued, then it's a pretty good sign that maybe your body's not getting enough energy to thrive and it's literally running on fumes just to survive. Essentially, a reverse diet is when we look at gradually increasing calories over a long period of time so that we can get the body back to a state of health. Uh, the goal when we reverse diet is to increase those calories, increase performance, improve health markers whilst minimizing any weight gain. Now, realistically, there might be a little bit of weight gain here, uh, but ideally, we keep track of what's happening and we adjust our calories as we, as we go to suit uh, how our body's adapting. Uh, so that is going to be completely dependent on how long you've been dieting for, how much metabolic adaptation you've caused. Now, this is the importance of tracking. This is why I told you guys in the first episode, make sure you track your food because once we work out our total daily energy expenditure, if we're only eating 1,500 calories but I haven't tracked, I might go from 2,600 calories, I'm going to go, I need to be in a deficit to lose weight, so I'm going to drop down to roughly uh, 2,100 calories. Sweet. I'm just going to use the algorithm that the app told me. I'm going to drop down 2,100 calories. Okay. Now, theoretically, you've put yourself into a deficit, but if you uh, haven't tracked your food and you don't know you're eating 1,500 calories and you go from 1,500 calories to all of a sudden tracking and eating 2,100 calories, now you've actually put yourself into a 600 calorie surplus. Theoretically, you're in a deficit, but after a couple of weeks, you're like, what the fuck is going on? Why am I putting on weight? Well, it's because you didn't track your food to start with, and now you've put yourself into a surplus rather than a deficit. In part two of the energy balance episode, we're going to dive a little bit deeper and have a look at the numbers. Uh, but to recap this episode, energy balance is what allows us to manipulate our weight to gain weight and improve health markers and performance, we must be in a calorie surplus. To lose weight, we need to be in a calorie deficit. That deficit is going to bring uh, some strength decreases, power decreases, performance decreases as well. Uh, to maintain weight, we must maintain equilibrium. Energy in equals energy out. Let's get ready for the next episode where we're, going to be, where we're going to be diving a little bit deeper into these numbers, what they mean, and how we can manipulate them to get the most out of our regime. The only thing that I want out of this podcast is to help people cut through the bullshit. In the health and fitness industry, there's so many snake oil salesmen and uh, magicians that promise everything for barely doing anything. Uh, well, I'm here to tell you that that's bullshit and if you want to make changes, you need to make changes. If you enjoy the message that I'm delivering, please help me spread the word and like, share, save and subscribe to my social media platforms. Instagram is at K-O-B-E-S underscore P-F-T at Kobes underscore P-F-T. My Facebook is Sean Kober and my business page is at performance 
functional training. You'll also find performance functional training on YouTube. Go and check that out and please pass this on to your friends, family, anyone else who would benefit from hearing this message. And if you could also leave me a five-star rating and review, that would be much appreciated. Anybody who does leave me a five-star rating and review will have precedence when it comes to my Q&A sessions. I'm going to be posting on my social media platforms in the coming weeks of questions and answers. You guys ask the questions, I will answer them on a podcast episode. That's it for me today, guys. Hopefully you enjoyed this episode and I look forward to bringing you some awesome content moving forward. Peace.